season of training uh, for the month of uh, July. Um, believe it or not, it's already July, the seventh month of the year. Time has gone by so swiftly. Uh, the Minister Howard is kicking off tonight in this lesson as we're talking about a hidden faith revealed. Uh, in this series of lessons, you'll find we'll be talking about uh, persons who uh, perhaps haven't been in the limelight of scripture, uh, but we'll pull out some of their characteristics and see how we can apply those to our lives today. What happens when hidden faith is uncovered and revealed? And again, uh, Minister Howard is going to be sharing with us tonight. Uh, we're going to have a, a word of prayer and we'll go ahead and get started. And prayerfully, the others will be joining us momentarily. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace, O oh God. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity, the privilege, the honor, O oh God, to go before you and to dig into your word tonight. I pray, O oh God, is as we go through these unsearchable riches of your scriptures, of your word, O oh God, that they be life-giving and they be challenging to your people, O oh God, to not only stop here, but to take what we get tonight and to go forward in it, O oh God, and to add to our uh, virtue and add to our knowledge and add to our praise, O oh God. We thank you for how you do what you do. Father, we pray that you bless this session, bless our teacher tonight, let your anointing be evident and prevail in the name of Jesus. Lord, bless every student tonight, every hearer of the word, O oh God, that we may be doers as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, thank you. Uh, looking forward to the lessons tonight. As you see, uh, that they will be uh, compiling uh, from here uh, to Sunday, and then again Thursday, and Sunday again. And on Sundays, we're going to be talking about miracle signs and wonders. And preferably, you'll see how all of these will connect together. Amen. God bless you. Uh, Minister Howard, it's yours. Good evening. God bless you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be uh, in the house of God. Literally, uh, one more time, glad to be on the line with everyone uh, this evening. Uh, it's amazing that uh, even uh, in this type of environment, we're still able to connect. And, and so I thank God for uh, Zoom and thank God for our pastor and first lady. Uh, on this evening, uh, and I'm looking forward to going uh, into the word, but Lord, thank God for our uh, president of Christian education, uh, Elder Rogers. Uh, on this evening, our uh, lesson will come from um, Luke. If you have your Bibles, uh, we're in the seventh chapter, and uh, we're going to be uh, coming from uh, looking at verses one through seven uh, for your consideration. Uh, our hidden Faith Revealed series uh, tonight is our first night on it, and we're, uh, the lesson topic is the centurion. A uh, very uh, familiar passage uh, for many of us that uh, have uh, been in this way for any amount of time. Uh, we have heard this lesson uh, several times, and so I pray tonight that uh, God is able to uh, give me something to uh, help uh, open up the eyes of our understanding tonight so uh, that we are all blessed and encouraged and edified. So uh, we're going to begin uh, at Luke, uh, the seventh chapter. Obviously, I'm using the King James Version on this evening. Uh, please forgive me if my uh, slides are a little uh, muddled. I'm using a, a PowerPoint and uh, they did not transfer well. So uh, if they're not coming across your screen, I will be sure to fix that. Luke, the seventh chapter, the first verse. Now, when he had ended all these sayings in the audience of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, the centurion, who we're referring to, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, 
that he was worthy for whom he should do this. Verse 5, for he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou should have entered under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. I love that final verse, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Father, thank you for this word on tonight, God. Open the eyes of our understanding that we're enlightened, God. God, keep us near the cross on tonight. Give us a word, God, that will edify and that you will be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to open up this lesson, uh, even though many of us are familiar with this passage, uh, I always want to approach uh, the lesson uh, as if we're all uh, brand new in the way. Uh, when Jesus taught, it was amazing how even when he taught children, whether he taught Jews or Gentiles, he spoke in such a way that everyone would have an understanding. So uh, on tonight, I have a few questions, and if you all would uh, 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 certainly entertain me tonight and work in dialogue with me, I'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, if you have anything to say, uh, typically uh, we're able to uh, raise a hand or say something in the chat box and uh, I'll be sure to give space uh, for you all to uh, give comments and or uh, ask questions. So uh, this uh, setting takes place in Capernaum. Uh, many of us know that Capernaum was uh, basically uh, Jesus's headquarters. Many of the miracles that Jesus did, he did from Capernaum. Uh, and, and it's recorded in scripture that um, that many of the things that we read here in uh, this earlier chapters of Luke and as well as Matthew, uh, many of these things happen, happen in uh, Capernaum. So uh, this particular uh, miracle uh, happens uh, in Capernaum uh, here. So what is a centurion? Uh, the scripture refers to uh, a centurion. Uh, a centurion uh, would have been a high ranking officer in the Roman military and so uh, just to create uh, uh, understanding of what that would be like today, it'd be equivalent to a captain in the army. Uh, these, these centurions typically, uh, they were uh, over uh, a century or a hundred uh, soldiers, and those soldiers would have typically possibly been o over, uh, they would have been officers as well, okay? So a centurion was a captain uh, over a century of soldiers, okay? And so this centurion, to become a centurion, uh, you would have been elected by your fellow soldiers, and uh, you also had to have a certain amount, a certain quality of character. Uh, anytime, uh, it's one thing to be uh, elected by uh, those who uh, lord over you, but uh, when you have people who are electing you, who are your colleagues, uh, you certainly, we all know when, when we're uh, getting a new boss or a new manager or anyone over us, we always want somebody who uh, has integrity, who treats us well, who uh, we know when we go into work with them, they're going to work with us. And so a centurion would have been one of the elite soldiers. Uh, they were uh, not just elite, but uh, they were uh, even greater than uh, what we would typically uh, see in just a regular soldier. These individuals were someone who soldiers could look to uh, when in battle they were to uh, go out in front of the remaining of the army. So when they went to war, the centurion would have been out front. Uh, so this man was, uh, uh, would have been very astute. Uh, he would have been well respected amongst the Romans. Uh, as well as uh, feared and respected amongst the Jews. Who is the servant that we're talking about in this text? Uh, if you if you have a uh, uh, if you're using an iPhone and using the Bible app, uh, depending on the version that you use, they give us a, a headline or a header of uh, what this certain uh, chapter is going to be about. It's a little misleading because. Uh, in my Bible, it shows that the headline is Jesus heals the centurion servant. But very little uh, information about this servant is given to us. 
Uh, we know for certain that this person is sick. Uh, uh, some theologians and some uh, some references that you read will say that uh, this center, this servant was sick with the palsy, which would mean they were paralyzed. Uh, you read in some in some references that it says that uh, this servant was uh, uh, going through a lot of pain uh, through this th being paralyzed. But what we know for certain is that this this individual was sick uh, unto death, uh, and so uh, Luke. Uh, does suggest that this servant was uh, very close to the centurion uh, because he states that the servant was very important to him. Uh, this servant would have been uh, someone who the centurion cared uh, very much about because in that day, uh, these servants, uh, they weren't servants that you just hired. These servants many times were slaves. Uh, and so uh, it, the Roman custom of that day, how they treat these slaves were um, less than, right? Um, they, they weren't treated uh, the same. They, they didn't typically live in the same quarters as the uh, master would have lived in. They would have had their own quarters to live in. Uh, so this centurion, even going about with his level of care for um, this servant is, is really uh, uh, amazing because uh, he, he is concerned about the individual who he lords over. When and how did the centurion hear about Jesus? We're going to uh, Matthew, the fourth chapter, if you'll turn with me there. And we're going to look at the 23rd through the 21st verse. 23 through 25, I'm sorry. And the 23rd verse reads, And Jesus went about all Galilee. Capernaum was a village in Galilee. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and of disease among the people. And his fame went out throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments and those who were possessed with devils which were possessed with devils and those which were lunatic and those that had the palsy and he healed them and there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and beyond Jordan. So the centurion would have heard about Jesus, not only from the great multitudes, but he heard Jesus had great fame going about Capernaum. He was uh, going through healing all manner of sickness. He was healing all manner of diseases. And just like we know in common day, we have social media, news travels fast. During that time, word of mouth was the, uh, was the uh, a form of communication, how word traveled. And that's still the greatest form of communication today, word of mouth. And I'm sure someone came to this uh, centurion, to possibly one of the elders that he sent. They came to this centurion and they said that Jesus is healing the sick and you have a servant there and if you want your servant healed get in contact with jesus do we have any questions so far no sir i don't have a lot of slides tonight but i pray that the information given uh sparks something in you so uh here we have what amazed jesus about this centurion's faith what was so amazing about this centurion's faith that, faith that it amazed Jesus? Uh, uh, Jesus was around many people, and uh, very few times do you see in Scripture Jesus being amazed, right? Uh, so what amazed Jesus about his faith? One, he approached Jesus with humility. When the elders uh, came to them, we see here in verse 3 Luke 7 verse 3 and when he heard of Jesus he sent unto him elders of the Jews beseeching him that they would come to his servant and when they came to Jesus they besought him instantly saying he was worthy that he was worthy of whom he should do this these elders that were sent these were uh, individuals who were uh, hierarchy amongst the Jews right uh, uh, they were well-respected. They were theologians. They 
uh, carried the scriptures. They knew the scripture. They knew uh, the customs of that day. Uh, and they came on behalf of this centurion just to show you how much respect and uh, appreciation that they had for this individual. The Bible says that this centurion man had built a synagogue or a church on behalf of the Jews, something that was unheard of. So we know that this individual was, was, was probably rich and maybe even wealthier. He had uh, connections. He got a church built on behalf of them. And the, uh, these, these elders came to Jesus immediately and they began saying to Jesus, Jesus, the man that we want you to do this for is worthy. Uh, many times uh, uh, we feel that because we have a certain rank or uh, that we've done certain things that uh, we're owed something. These men came on behalf of him and the first thing they're saying is, Jesus, we owe this man. Uh, not only do we owe him, but he's worthy. He's done so much for us and we need to make sure that you take care of him. This is how they came to him and they pleaded with Jesus. Jesus, please come do this for this man because he's not a regular individual. But the first thing that we see from uh, the centurion when he approaches Jesus in the seventh chapter and the sixth verse, it says, then Jesus went with them. And when he was not far off from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy. Listen to that, that thou should have entered my roof. Now, here we are talking about someone who was respected, right? Uh, uh, Rome uh, was in control of this area during that day, and uh, uh, all these individuals would have been subordinate to this Roman centurion. Here's this centurion understanding Christ's authority. Uh, he approaches Jesus with humility. Uh, go with me for a moment to uh, Ephesians, the second chapter and the eighth verse. Ephesians 2 and 8. I'm going to read it for your hearing. For by grace are ye saved. How are we saved? We're saved through grace. Listen. Through faith and not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. These elders who were individuals who were astute in the gospel at that time, they knew uh, the Jewish practices, they knew the laws of Moses, they were the ones who would teach uh, the people when they came, and here they are coming to Jesus first off the wrong way. They're coming to Jesus talking about why someone is worthy of something that Jesus should do to him. The word of God tells us first off that we're not worthy. Even our righteousness is as filthy rags. These Jews, these, these Jewish elders still didn't have a full understanding. Listen to that word and remember it tonight. They did not have a full understanding of Jesus and who he was. But this Roman soldier who was not familiar so much with these customs of the Jews, he typically wouldn't have been raised uh, practicing Judaism, right? Uh, he wouldn't have been raised uh, uh, doing the Passover feast or the Feast of Unleavened Bread or any of these other uh, uh, items that the, the Jewish people would have, um, would have uh, done in their, that was their custom. But he understood how to come to Christ. We have to be sure that when we come to Jesus, we first come to him with humility, right? We have to come to him respecting that he's a sovereign God and understanding that the only reason that we are given, given anything is because of the grace of God. The Bible, like I said, by grace we are saved through our faith. The second thing was he understood protocol. Uh, I'm looking at Deacon Bennett's picture here and many of our deacon board uh, that is excellent at our church uh, many of them are uh, military, were in the military, uh, some branch of uh, the military. The one thing that they all have in common and the one thing that they have taught me uh, is protocol. There is a way to do everything. There is a set of authority that's put in place. There are certain times to do things and certain times you should not. When the pastor is up preaching and he going to work, 
that is not the time for me to walk up to him and wipe his head with the handkerchief. It's not into protocol. It would not be the right thing to do. This Roman soldier understood protocol. How do we know he understood protocol? Because right here in, uh, in chapter 7 of Luke, verse 8, he said, For I also am a man under authority. He understood where he fell in all of this. Having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Here he is, understanding protocol, the simple thing that uh, uh, many of us still don't have a, a real grasp of. When you understand who is co in control, you understand who to go to when you need something done. When we're at the church, and uh, just to put it in perspective for all you, it's hot in, in the quarry. Uh, 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 they don't come to me and say, turn down the air conditioner. We know to go to Deacon Bennett, go to one of the deacons, go to Deacon Newsom, and say, turn down the air conditioner. Turn the air conditioner. It's hot in here. Why? Because we understand who to go to, who is the authority over that thing. And this Roman centurion understood who the authority figure was here. If you understand who's in authority and who's in control, you won't go to other places when you need something done. I wish somebody would say amen. When you need something done, you go directly to where you need it done in order to get it taken care of. And so this Roman soldier, because he was a man of military understanding, he understood protocol. And this amazed Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew 8 chapter. Matthew 8. I'm using several uh, devices here to get to the scripture. Verse 24. Matthew 8 and 24, listen what it says. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. I want to tie this together for you tonight. It's so much that the ship was covered with waves, but he, Jesus, was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, lest we perish. And he said unto them, Listen, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the waves and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, Listen, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? It was the individuals who were closest to Jesus, his disciples, the ones who walked with him every day, the ones who saw him heal people. He saw him lay hands on the sick and they recovered. He saw him, they saw him give sight to the blind. They saw him in all types of situations, and yet they still did not realize who was in control. I pray that each of us realize in our lives when we're going through our storms, who we can call on to calm the storm. We should not get excited. We should not fret. We should not be afraid because if we understand that Jesus is in control, if we understand protocol, if we understand who the authority is on this, then we don't have to worry because God is always in control. Did we have any questions? Any comments? Not yet. No. Good. <laughs> the third thing that this Roman centurion understood, he understood the power of the word. How do we know? Let's go back to the scripture. The text, Luke 7 and 7 says, Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy unto thee. The centurion, he was uh, 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 humble the way he came to Jesus. He said, I didn't even want to come to you, Jesus. He said, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Jesus, if you just send your word, Jesus, you ain't got to stop by my house because I know that uh, I'm not worthy uh, for you to walk in my door, but, but Jesus, if you just send your word, I believe it will be done. That's great faith from an individual who uh, was not uh, a Jew. 
He was a Gentile. That's great faith from an individual who uh, seemingly knew nothing about Jesus and, and did not go to the synagogue to hear them teach and did not go to the church to hear them preach. This individual who would have been an outsider, even this individual understands that Jesus is in control. We have a hand. Amen. Elder Rogers? You know, uh, uh, Minister Howard, you, you step right into what my comment was going to be, which is the fact that he is an outsider to me is what, what, what spins off this incredible act of faith is that he's not a churchgoer. He's not, he, and for, but for whatever reason, his heart has been touched to be sensitive to the things of God. Mm. Which I think is a good lesson that we can learn that don't just cross off people just because they're not in the church, because sometimes they'll be some of the greatest assets to the church. Um, they talked about he was a person who helped build the synagogue that they did. He, he, his heart, though he was not a church man, his heart was sensitive to the issues of the church. Mm. He recognized that he was not a church person and why he didn't even want to go see Jesus himself. So to me, the act of faith, for him to move in this space, um, to, to move out there, to go do this, um, to stick his name out there like that, um, and, and it was, was an incredible act of faith to me, um, because one, he is an insider, and he has enough understanding of what God will do and the power of his word without actually having biblical teaching, without actually having been taught completely the ways of the Lord. He seemed to have grasped at his own level of understanding using what he knew and relating it to God, which I think is really how God calls a lot of us, taking what we know and we understand and applying it directly to him. Hey man, thank you, Elder Rogers, for uh, that comment. You uh, you are right in line with uh, it, with the same thing that uh, was in my my lesson tonight. Right, uh, we cannot be so uh, closed minded that we believe that the only people that can uh, make an impact in the kingdom of God are those who come to the church. Right, uh, we've learned so much, uh, I believe, during this time of pandemic, and we're going to touch on that just slightly. But we've learned so much, I believe, that we've grown uh, in the way and understanding of God uh, that we understand that uh, sometimes things don't look the way we thought they were going to look. Uh, this centurion really pulled that out because uh, you would have never, uh, you never heard of someone uh, asking Jesus to send a word uh, previous to, to this. I, I, I was reading and uh, this centurion really came out of left field. He for certain uh, uh, had it because he hadn't walked with Jesus. The way that he had heard of people being healed and, and set free, Jesus walked by them and one woman grabbed his robe and she was healed. And another one he laid his hands on or he spit in the sand and made mud and put it on their eyes. But this is the first time where we're hearing of uh, uh, someone coming to Jesus and he's saying, just send your word. Isaiah 55 and 11, go there with me, please. The King James Version. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I told you that this centurion understand the power. He understood the power of the word. Too many times I don't believe we understand the power of what comes out of our mouth. If we understood the things that come out of our mouth, we wouldn't say certain things. I stopped saying, uh, I feel so sick. I stopped just, I stopped being so loose with my words. God, guard my tongue so that I won't just say any and everything. Because when it leads out of our mouth, we give life to these things. The Bible says that the word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return void you will have exactly what you say. Yes. You will have exactly 
what you say. You will have exactly what you say. And once you grab hold to that, you'll begin speaking differently about your family, differently about your situation, differently about your friends. Growing up, one of my neighbors, uh, he was my best friend growing up. And uh, all throughout uh, our childhood, I would hear his grandmother and his mother saying to him that he was dumb. He was never going to be anything. And uh, he didn't know how to do this. and He didn't know how to do that. And I never really had an understanding of that. But to this day, he hasn't become anything. He struggled to get out of his own mindset because they beat that into his mind throughout his entire childhood. We have to watch the things that we say to our youth, the things that we say to our children. If they're struggling, if we see them struggling, speak a word that will help them do things better. If they're having a hard time in school, speak a word that will force them to be better. You right, Elder Rogers, your words have power. You will do good in school. You will make A's and B's. I see you going to college. I see you in the future and you look better than you look right now. We have to change how we speak. And this centurion, even though he was a Gentile, even though he didn't walk with Jesus, he understood the word of God. He understood the power of the word, that the word that comes out of our mouth will not return void, but it will accomplish. Somebody said will accomplish that which is set out to perform. Thank God for the word. I'm going to move right forward into this text. I heard a preacher coin this, the centurion factor. The centurion factor. Uh, if you ever watched any TV a few years ago, we had a show called The Fear Factor. And the Fear Factor was the one thing that set everything apart, right? It was the one thing that you feared the most that had the most effect on you. This is what we're going to call tonight the centurion factor. I was, uh, I was going, uh, we were almost on an activity bus. Uh, I believe it was in high school. We were going to a basketball game. We were running behind. The game was out of town. It was probably a, it was probably a, uh, a playoff game. I'm not sure. But I remember we were running behind, and I sat behind the, uh, uh, the coach was the bus driver. And I was sitting behind the, uh, uh, the bus driver, and I was asking him, I said, Coach, I said, uh, uh, the, the speedometer says 100, but this bus is topping out at 45. I said, you don't think you can go any, fa any faster? And he explained to me that the bus had on it a device that caused it not to go any faster. The device was called a governor. Many of us, our faith has a governor. The Bible says in Ephesians 20, let me turn to it. I'm sorry, Ephesians 3 and 20. I apologize. The Bible says this, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Many of us have a governor on our faith and we limit what God can do. Listen to what I'm saying. We limit what God can do. Why? Because he can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all, but it's according to the power that worketh in us. You have to take the governor off of your faith. This centurion he did not limit Jesus to coming and laying hands, even though he had never heard anything different. This centurion had never heard that Jesus sent a word. The only thing that he had probably heard was that Jesus laid hands on the sick and they recovered. But here he is not being closed minded. Here he is exercising faith and saying, Jesus, if you just do it differently. We have to be careful all the time thinking that Jesus is going to do something the way that we saw it in our mind. I have to watch myself uh, when I have a vision about what, the way I want to see things happen. Sometimes I stick to the script too much. Sometimes if Jesus doesn't do it the way that I thought it should happen, uh, uh, I'm upset. Remember Sarah in, in Genesis, right? 
Abraham was told you would have a baby. The way that they were typically knowing that they were going to have a baby was through uh, the common practice, right? A man lay with his woman and she got pregnant. And God sent a word and said, Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations and give you many descendants. But because God wasn't doing it the way that they had seen him do it in the past, they tried to take things into their own hands and they made a mess. We have to be careful putting God in a box. Before Corona, before Corona came, the only way that many people thought you could have church was in the house of God. I even heard people say, how dare this preacher, how dare that preacher just do an online ministry? I would hear people say, why don't this, this one and that one come to church? You can't get the Holy Ghost if you don't come to church. You can't get the word if you don't come to church. I heard that so much. But here we are in Corona, all sitting at home, and God's work is still going forth. Because Isaiah 55 and 11 says that his word will go forth and it will accomplish what it's set out to accomplish, whether it's through Zoom, whether it's through Facebook, whether it's in the house, whether it's on the street corner, regardless of how God decides to do it, it will get accomplished. And when we realize it and take the governor off of our faith, God can do so much more in our lives. Why are we struggling? Because we got the governor on. Why are we having a hard time? Because we got the governor on. Oh, I, I, God, I can only do it if I'm making four, doing 40 hours a week. I can only pay my bills a nine to five. And God wants to make you an entrepreneur. Take the governor off. Oh, God, if you don't give me a car like this, if I don't get a loan, I can't go down to the bank to get that house. Take the governor off. God wants somebody to give you a house. Start speaking it. You will have what you say, but you have to take the limits off of God. First, you got to take the limits off your thinking. And here is the centurion showing us as a Gentile, showing us as someone who was not in church, who did not grow up in church, who was not around the pastor. I used to pat myself on the back and say, I grew up in Faith Temple. I was Bishop. I was in Bishop Anderson Church. I had to check myself one day because I met somebody who didn't grow up in church, and at that time, they was living better than me. And I was ashamed because this person didn't grow up in church, but they had enough respect for the Word of God to live a life that was upstanding before God. We got to be careful. We got to be careful getting familiar with the Word of God. We got to be careful getting caught up in our traditions and with the way we're used to doing things. The Bible says that the traditions of men cause the Bible to be of none effect. If we're so stuck in this, imagine if we were so stuck a few years ago when it was presented to the church to provide cameras. Some people were rumbling and complaining. I don't understand why we need a camera. I don't know why we need a TV screen. Here God is doing something. He's preparing us for 2020. But if we stuck in 1997, he can't get us ready for 2020. If someone would not have listened to the word of the Lord and gotten cameras for us, we, we might be like some of these janky ministries on Facebook with the camera falling every which way. But we listened to the word of God. We took the governor off. And we allow ourselves to walk in faith. Faith is what? Faith is the hope for things that we don't see yet. You got to have faith in things that you have not seen yet. I haven't seen that house, but my faith tells me that God is going to provide. I don't have the job I want, but my faith tells me that God is going to provide. I've never seen it done this way. But do you know that God will cause people to create a position for you at your job? Do you know that God will cause people to do things on your behalf? We have another hand. Go ahead. Oh, I, I was, yeah, I was letting you go there for a minute there, Minister Howard. I, I was going to just point out, um, you know, looking even closer at the text, um, 
right before Jesus, when he says what he says to Jesus, the scripture says Jesus turned him around. Mm. Uh, and in other words, here was a man who didn't want the attention, was mm. trying to avoid the attention, trying to stay out of the limelight. But because of his faith, it brought him full turn into the light. Jesus shined the light on him. Mm. In other words, to me, I take away that, that you can operate in faith without trying to get seen. And the Lord, as the scripture said, your gift will make room for you. And the Lord you will shine the light upon you. Mm -hmm. He's trying to stay in darkness and stay in the background to just to get his servant healed. But because of his faith and how he operated on behalf, again, on behalf of someone else, that's the other thing. He was operating not for himself, mm. he was operating under, under, underground on behalf of somebody else. Yes, sir. The Lord turned him around and shined the light on him to talk about, it, it, this wasn't in our, but if you go past a little later to say he hasn't seen this kind of faith in Israel, Jesus turns and shines a light on him because of his selflessness and humility mm. and his act of faith. Elder Rogers, you pulled something excellent out of that. Uh, it's amazing what God will do when we take the, the concern off of ourselves and we concentrate on other people. Thank you for, thank you so much uh, for that comment. Did we have another hand? No, sir. Thank you, Elder Rogers. Our next point, <clears throat> I want to move right along. My next point is to seek to understand God's word in an effort to apply it to your life. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 17 through 19, read like this. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Your eyes of your understanding awakening. The eyes of your understanding really seeing what the Spirit is saying to the church. That ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who would believe according to the working of his mighty power. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have to seek to understand God's word. Sometimes the governor is on us because we don't truly understand what God was trying to say. Sometimes the governor is on our faith because we don't have an understanding of what God was trying to express. And here are elders. Look at these elders in the text. The elders, the Jewish elders here in the text, even though they understood the Mosaic laws, even though they were the ones who stood before the people, they still did not understand biblical principles. <clears throat> because when they came to Jesus, they came talking about how worthy this one was and how worthy that one was. They did not have an understanding because if they did, they wouldn't come to Jesus and have said anything about this man's resume. Your resume does not matter. Jesus gave sight to the blind. He healed lepers. Lepers were outcasts. The woman at the well, she was an outcast. Jesus was not concerned about this man's resume. He was not concerned that he had his name on the pews at the church. He was not concerned that he had a parking spot. All Jesus was concerned about was that the servant needed to be made whole. We have to seek to understand the word of God and not just understand from our perspective or understand from our vantage point, but we have to understand what the spirit is saying to the church 
And the only way that we can understand what the Spirit is saying is to the church is to get into the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. Coming to TNT, listen to the pastor preach on Sunday. Your faith, your governor will come off by hearing the word of God and understanding the word of God. How can I get the centurion factor? How can I take the governor off? I have to understand the word of God. Growing up, my mother forced us to read Ephesians every morning. I learned this, I learned the book of Ephesians by heart early on in life. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. There's so much in here, but it calls my young mind. We pray this every day. God, give me an understanding. I don't want to just be able to get up and preach and teach. I don't want to just be able to say I'm a Christian. I want to have a real understanding of what you meant when you said love your neighbor as yourself. I want to have a real understanding of what you meant when you said you died for me and you took those stripes for me. I want to have an understanding of your word. Why? So that I can live by faith. It takes you to our next point. Our next point is coming out of Romans, the first chapter. Romans, the first chapter, and I'm almost done. The 17th verse, look what it says. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to, from faith, to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We should not only use our faith for miracles. We should not only use our faith for uh, uh, blessings, but we have to use our faith to live right. I heard an amen from, from a corner over on the right. We have to use our faith to live right. Our faith should cause us to walk upright before God. Our faith should cause us to live according to the word of God. When we walk by faith, we believe that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. I'm not just believing God for miracles. I'm believing God to help me live right. I'm not just believing God for blessings. My faith is what helps me walk right before God. Our faith is, that's why the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why is it impossible to please God? Because if you don't have faith in the word of God, you will never live right. If you don't have faith in the word of God, we will never tithe consistently. If you don't have faith in the word of God, you will not live according to the principles that the Bible put in place. By faith, we are saved. You can't, be, you can't even be saved without faith. The only way that we can live the life that God has set before us to live is by faith. The Bible says, I wish above all things that you prosper and you be in health, but at the same rate your soul prospers. At the same rate, that's measurement. Even as, that's a measurement. He's saying, listen, you will never get those things that you want that are worldly. You will never get those houses and land and cars and all these things you desire on earth if your spirit, man, doesn't catch up. I wish you about all things that you prosper. He wants you to prosper. He wants us to be in health. But first off, our soul and our spirit, man, has to be healthy. How can my spirit, man, be healthy without faith? Because, because without faith, I won't believe God the way I ought to. Is there a hand? No, sir. That slide came through twice. Here we have Matthew 13, 33, 31, I'm sorry. Talks about faith the size of a mustard seed. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take a lot, but it does take us taking God at his word. Taking God at his word. God, you said that you would do it. And then when we know that God says he will do it, change the way we talk about he's going to do it. Stop just talking recklessly day to day. Stop just saying anything. Mustard seeds faith causes the little faith that we have to do big damage. The Bible says that with faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. 
But that mountain that God may move, he may not move it the way you thought he was going to do it. Here are the elders, the Jews again. They think that Jesus has to come and lay hands, right? He thinks that Jesus has to come and come into the house and lay hands and say you're healed. But here we have the centurion who understands mustard seed faith. Jesus, I'm not worthy of you coming to my house. But Jesus, if you just send the word, I know my bills are going to be paid. Hallelujah. Jesus, if you just send the word, I know that this sickness got to leave my body. Jesus, if you just send the word, you put in what you need from God. Tonight, you ought to tell God, Jesus, if you just send the word, I know that my situation will be rectified because all it takes is his word. I'm finished. This week, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you this week. Sherman Memorial, I want to challenge you this week, and I'm challenging myself. Take the limits off of what God wants to do. I challenge you this week. Take God at his word. I challenge you this week. Take the governor off your faith. Take the governor off your faith. Take the limits off of God. Jeremiah 29, 11 already told us of the plans that God has for us. He says he has plans of good and not of evil. The word has already gone forth. The word went forth before you were in your mother's womb. He already said, I see good in your life. He already said, I see you as a lender and not a borrower. Hallelujah. He already said, I see you with a good job. I don't see you struggling. I already see, I already see you in abundance. I already see you in overflow. I already see it. It's already done suddenly. But we have to take the governor off of God. We have to take the governor off of God. All this word that we're getting every Sunday, all this word we're getting every Thursday is useless if you put the limits on your faith. It's going to take you speaking differently. It's going to take you speaking differently about your family. It's going to take you. You might be the only person in your family that's able to break the generational curse. I dare you to start speaking different about that cousin that's always calling about borrowing money. I dare you to start speaking they're going to have a job and a good job. I dare you to change how you talk. I'm challenging you, Sherman Memorial, this week. God is going to do a suddenly. Hallelujah. He's going to do a suddenly. I dare you this week to exercise faith outside of your comfort zone like this centurion did. He never heard of anyone asking Jesus to send a word. There's so much more that we can pull out of this, but the time is, 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 is ended. But I, I want you to remember, I want you to remember to take the governor off of your faith. If you don't get anything from me tonight, I want you to remember that it's already done. God wants to do something excellent in our lives. He wants to do something excellent in our church, but we have to change the way we speak. Focus on having the centurion factor. I'm going to go to it one last time so you can see it. Take the governor off. Seek to understand God's word in an effort to apply it to your life and use faith to live, not only for miracles. God bless you. I appreciate uh, the time that I had to share with you, I apologize if I cut some corners and ran through the field, but I believe that God gave us something tonight that we'll be able to carry away, and I pray that God does something excellent in your life from this word. Before I pass this on, I never want to walk away without giving someone the opportunity to know God and the pardon of their sins. You may be on this call, you may be on this Zoom call, and you don't know Jesus, or you may need to uh, rededicate your life to him. The Bible says that through this faith I was talking about tonight, we're saved. It doesn't take a lot of faith. It just takes faith the size of a mustard seed. Tonight, all you have to do, the Bible says in Romans, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and secondly, believe in your heart, if you have faith in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. If you, if you did that tonight, get in contact with us here at Sherman Memorial. We want to be in contact with you. God bless you, and I, I pray that heaven smiles down on you. Bless you, Minister Howard. Great blessing. Pastor, you going to give it into your hands? Uh, I don't know if I should say anything. <laughs> My God, what a word tonight. Uh, thank you, Minister Howard. Well done. Um, I may do like some of the uh, senior fathers would do and um, take credit. I made a good choice tonight for the uh, lesson. <laughs> thank God. And uh, thank God for our, our uh, Dean of Education, Elder uh, Rogers, uh, who's coordinated this for me uh, for the month of uh, July. Uh, we've got some more dynamic teachers coming forth this week. I want you to stay tuned. Uh, these lessons, again, will uh, connect together throughout the entire month. Um, throughout the entire month, we're, we're going through, uh, you know, miracles, signs, and wonders, and we'll also be dealing with the topic of hidden faith revealed, uh, which is what takes us to uh, miracles, signs, and wonders as we're coming through the um, after effect, which followed radical faith. We're continuing in the same vein, and I believe that this is a very timely uh, word in this season. And if you will grab hold of it and hold on and don't let go, amen. So then faith cometh by hearing and the hearing by the word of God, amen. Thank God for his word. That's all we have to stand on. That is our foundation and the truth uh, that will, any truth will ever know, amen, is a result of God's word. Thank you all for joining tonight. Minister Howard. I'll give you the honors tonight. Pastor is on you, Pastor is on you sir. So I, was, I was going to say that with a caveat. I don't want you yes, to Yes, sir, please. <laughs> yes, sir. You, you did well tonight, but uh, Sherman has a pastor. They do. And I, I'm a man under authority. All right. You can't be in authority if you're not under authority. God bless you tonight. Well done, son. Well done. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. So God, thank you for allowing us this privilege, amen, to spend time in your word tonight. I pray, God, that somebody's faith is stirred. And God, to go back, to dig a little deeper, to, to, to seek a little more, God, to be more determined, oh God, to be pleasing in your sight. God, I thank you for your word that is alive. Oh God, let it continue to captivate your people daily. God, we thank you for every household that's represented here tonight. I pray, oh God, your exponential blessings and favor will overtake your people, oh God, like never before. God, we thank you for the testimony that you've given, amen, because of your goodness, because of your greatness, because of your godness. Oh God, as we are in this session tonight, I pray that our fellowship will not be broken, oh God, and that you will bring us back together again at the appointed time in the spirit of unity and in the bond of peace we pray in Jesus name thank God amen